Hello everyone, uh, my name is Chloe Oliver. I'm the Senior Psychologist at the Alan Walker Cancer Care Centre located in Darwin. Um, I'm very sorry that I'm having to do this via recording and that I couldn't actually um, appear via Zoom and have some time to be able to interact with you all during this. Um, so bear with me because this is pre-recorded, um, but we will try and cover off as much as we possibly can. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking to you all about managing the emotional aspects um, of breast cancer and all of the challenges that go with that. What I'm really hoping that we're able to do today is to have um, a much more kind of realistic look at some of the challenges that operate for you. And I also want to draw the distinction between people who are going through either early diagnosis breast cancer and might be in active treatment or into surveillance or survivorship and those who have been given a metastatic diagnosis because those two groups um, really have some unique challenges between them. Um, I know that I'm not going to be able to cover everything that you might want to hear about, so apologies if I miss something that feels particularly important for you, but this is such a big and broad area that I'm not going to ever be able to do justice to all of the different parts of this. So I've tried to cover as much as I possibly can. The first thing I want to start off with is just quickly talking to you about um, the specialty that I'm in, which is what we would call psycho-oncology. So psycho-oncology is still quite a new area of specialty. It only originated in the 1970s um, and it originated from a wonderful doctor named Jimmy Holland. And she clearly identified that when treating cancer, we're missing part of an important aspect for people if we're only treating the physical. Her real focus on is how do we make life better for patients with cancer. So psycho-oncology specifically addresses the factors that are unique to people who have a cancer diagnosis and are undergoing cancer treatment and acknowledges that the psychological struggles that people may have outside of that are not the same for the group that you're in. So what I can promise you for today is that there will be no inspirational quotes here. This is something incredibly difficult that you're all dealing with and no amount of inspirational quotes are going to make that magically feel better. So again, like I said before, I want this to be uh, quite a realistic talk about the kinds of challenges and to try and give you some practical um, skills to take away from today to try and meet some of those challenges as well. So I guess let's start at the beginning from the point of diagnosis, that move from me, as I've always known myself, to cancer patient. There can be all sorts of struggles at this point. There can be shock, confusion, having to make very quick decisions often about what kind of treatment you want to take, making decisions about whether you want to disclose to family and friends, how you want to disclose and who you want to disclose to, having to take time off work, all the practicalities around that, and the biggest shift is that moving from feeling like you're in control of your life and being able to make independent decisions about how your day-to-day -day life goes to that shift of feeling that you are a patient in the system and that sense of control is gone. Then moving into the challenges of active treatment and that does present its own unique challenges. We've got the physical side effects from treatment. No matter what treatment pathway you're under, whether that be surgical, chemotherapy, radiation, a combination of all of those. Um, some people can feel as though if they've just had to have surgery and they haven't had to undergo chemotherapy or radiation, that that somewhat kind of lessens in a way their treatment and that they don't have as much right to be upset about things if they've just had surgery. There is no one pathway with treatment that is any more valid to having distress as any others. Um, during this time too, you're trying to adapt to a disrupted reality. Um, things don't feel the same. The world can feel quite different during the time that you're going through treatment. Um, how do you want to identify during this time too? Do you want to identify as feeling like a cancer patient? Does that sit comfortably with you, does it not? Um, having uncertainty around how the treatment is going to go, um, the physical trauma from treatment as well, the emotional distress and your concern for family 
Interestingly, from a psychological perspective, one thing that we can see here is at the point of diagnosis, distress can actually be very, very high. You've just been met with a life-changing piece of information. And then there is often lag time between that point of diagnosis and when you commence treatment. That could be because more tests are needed, there needs to be more medical opinion, you're awaiting things to start. And so distress can be quite high. What we can see is then as soon as treatment actually does start, so you start your uh, chemotherapy, you're into radiation, or your surgery date is scheduled, distress can actually drop somewhat. And that's often because there's a sense of relief in knowing that something is finally being done, that at least treatment is happening and that the cancer is actually being targeted. So for a lot of people, although you would think that this is often the most distressing time, for lots of people, distress can actually drop during this period. That move to post-active treatment. And notice that I don't say the end of treatment because this time period presents its own unique challenges as well. It's that move from being a patient back to what? If all of a sudden treatment finishes and a lot of people peg a lot of hope on the idea of like, I just need to get to the end. When I get to the end, everything's gonna feel okay again. And for a lot of people, it doesn't. You get to the end of that treatment and things can feel very unsettled. There can be a real sense of limbo during that stage, um, not knowing how you want to identify or what feels important for you in that period. Do I want to go back to the same job? Do I not? Am I dealing with physical changes to my body and my self-esteem and how do I feel about all of that? you are still going to be facing in post-active treatment, lots of symptoms. Your body is in active recovery at that period. It is not the end to things for a lot of people. It's just the beginning at that phase. There can be ongoing financial stresses, those difficulties that people can have with perceptions from others that, you know, oh, but you look so well, you must be feeling so good. Isn't it fantastic that treatment is finished? And while yes, that might be true in some ways, your body isn't going to feel the same. So what I hear a lot of people saying is kind of going, yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. And it doesn't really feel like that at all. And that struggle between how do we respond to people when they're saying things like that versus how I actually feel can be a real challenge for a lot of people. It can also be the time where the full weight of what has just happened starts to sink in. While you're in treatment and after first receiving your diagnosis, you're in like an acute crisis. You've just got to move through. Things have got to get done. You're moving from appointment to appointment. It is a full-time job. And when that stops, for a lot of people, that can be the time where they suddenly stop and they take stock and they go, oh my gosh, that just happened. And that is a very challenging point for people. And so for a lot of people that we see come through our service, um, that is the time that distress can often be the highest, even though people think that they shouldn't be feeling all of that. And maybe it thinks that means, sorry, that they're not feeling grateful about it because why are they struggling so much now that everything's done? And they shouldn't be beating themselves up about that because this is for a lot of people, one of the most difficult periods. The next thing that I want to talk about is the differences for the people who fall into the metastatic group in terms of diagnoses. And this pathway can come about a number of different ways. For some people, they will get the metastatic diagnosis at the first point that they discover that they have cancer, and that is incredibly challenging. For other people, this may come about um, after a period of treatment that they then find has not been successful and that the cancer has spread, has metastasized. For other people, they may have had cancer previously and gone through a long period of being cancer free, um, then to discover many years later that the cancer um, has not only returned, but they are now metastatic. For this group in particular, I think it's really important that we acknowledge the differences that exist here with this kind of diagnosis. So for lots of people, there will be a very significant grief reaction 
associated with this, that shock, anger, disbelief, bargaining, derealization, which means the world just stops feeling real. Everything doesn't feel the same. You can have threat-based reactions, so fight, flight, fight, flight, freeze, fawn, um, not knowing what to do. Some people won't have any kind of reaction at all. You might be very, very numb during that period and wondering, why aren't I having a strong reaction? And there is no wrong nor right way to react to a diagnosis like this. The challenges then stretch further about disclosures again, family, friends. It is a huge diagnosis to be sharing with people. How do I want to share it with them? Who do I want to share this with? Who is going to understand? You've got decisions regarding life and work. Do I want to keep working if I'm feeling well and my disease is reasonably well controlled? I want to keep working. Or maybe you don't. And again, no right nor wrong way to be approaching that. But these are the kinds of challenges we see that needing to make decisions on treatment choices. You might be presented with lots of different options from the doctors and feel uncertain about what you want to take at that point or what you don't want. Managing the physical side effects, the body changes, um, surgical changes, treatment effects, all of these still come into play with a metastatic diagnosis. The other real challenge for this group is that sense of belonging, about where do we fit? There can be such a big focus on you know, survivorship models and that's the kind of thing that we see in the media and that's what we see around us and there's lots of talk of people you know, beating cancer and fighting cancer and being cancer free and there can be such a lack of understanding about what a metastatic diagnosis means. This idea that people understand that you can live with cancer and the cancer can be well controlled but technically it is terminal it will not go away people have a lot of difficulty with drawing the distinction between having an imminently terminal diagnosis and being able to continue on and having this ongoing treatment for metastatic disease but that it's not going to go away that the aim here is that we're not able to cure it, but we may be able to control it. Um, along with that comes managing uh, people's misconceptions around that, advocating for yourself in that space, how much you want to do that as well. Um, there'll be people who are close to you that you might want to share lots of things with. There'll be people further away who you don't need to share and try and explain all of those unique challenges to. They'll be managing your own emotional reactions as well. There will be emotional swings. You can go from that point of feeling reasonably in control and almost sitting a bit more comfortably with it to just the other side of the pendulum and going this, no, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want to be here. And those swings are difficult to manage. Um, and one of the biggest ones is identity. With knowing that you have a metastatic diagnosis and that the cancer is there and it is present. That fusion of feeling as though you're your diagnosis and you're not. You're still you. You're still the you that you always were, but this is a part of what is happening for you. So let's talk about some of the challenges that exist kind of across both groups. Fear of reoccurrence, for our early diagnosis group is very common following active treatment. Post-active treatment, people can become really hypervigilant to any possible signs that the cancer has returned, lots of physical signs often. There can be a fear of progression that goes for the early diagnosis group or for the metastatic group, that feeling of, you know, that the cancer is getting worse. It must be spreading, things, things aren't in control. Like, they tell me that they are and those sort of anxious thoughts that's there in the background feelings of being in a limbo are huge for both groups too that lead up to the scans where you're going hmm, i don't want to put all of my hope on the getting a good scan result and so living in that limbo period where you're almost not letting yourself do anything for fear of what the scan results are going to come back with so it's that holding pattern that people get into and these are all normal in essence. So these happen. 
But just because something is normal does not mean that you should just go on struggling with it. So like I've said at that bottom bit, it's all well and good for me to say that's normal. It should ease over time, especially if you're a recurrence for our early group. But we also need to be able to do things with that. It's not enough for us to just say this is normal and this is kind of expected. So first thing that we need to do, though, is to understand how our thinking works. So I want to talk to you all about a thing called automatic negative thoughts. So automatic negative thoughts are not something that you are causing. They happen like that. Um, there are many different kinds of thoughts as well, and I want to take you through some examples of them. So some of that could be black and white thinking, so seeing things in extremes, example of that is, well, they're either going to cure me or I'm going to die. And that's it. There's no wiggle room between that. There can be thoughts of overgeneralization. So one negative event indicates everything is going wrong in life. So I can't even do the shopping, can't even do the cleaning, can't even pick the kids up at the moment. I'm, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm a burden. And it just generalizes everything to the negative. Discounting the positive is another big one. Um, so these results might have been good, but the, I just know that the treatment won't work. Or for a metastatic group, these results have been good, but you watch, by the next scan, things will have spread. There can be mind reading, assuming other thoughts uh, and intentions. So my mom or my partner or my best mate, they didn't call me. After I'd had my appointment, they knew that I was having my chemo today or they knew that I had that specialist appointment coming up. It means that they don't care or they think that this is not important. Shoulds are another big one. So directing yourself or others uh, with be, uh, like unrealistic shoulds. So I really should be doing more. I'm lazy. I should be getting myself up and going to the gym. I should be taking myself for that walk. I should, I should, I should. And shoulds tend to just be obligation driven. They're not actually driven by things that we tend to want to do. They're things that we think that we ought to do. So the result of those is usually that we don't end up doing them because we don't want to do them. But then we also feel bad about them too. So we then beat ourselves up about it and it just breeds resentment and obligation. And it's not based on things that we actually think that we want to be doing. The final thing to say about automatic negative thoughts before we get into kind of what to do about those is for a lot of people, they're kind of protective mechanisms. I hear a lot of people talk about like positive beliefs about them. So if I think about the worst case scenario, if I do this black and white thinking, then it's somehow going to prepare me for something bad happens. So then I won't be disappointed. I won't be as upset about it. If I think about the worst possible scenario, it'll prepare me in some way. But if you actually think about all of the things that have happened in your life that you've had to deal with that have been difficult, no amount of thinking in the lead up to those changes how upset you will feel. It doesn't best prepare you. In fact, usually when we have something unexpected happen, we haven't had a lot of lead up time and we've just dealt with it and we have done the best that we possibly can. But holding on to those positive beliefs and thinking, well, this will prepare me for it, or I won't be just so disappointed, or I'll, I'll react better, or I won't be so upset. You're just ending up holding on to something that's not real. But if you put a lot of emphasis on that, you will keep doing that negative thinking. So now that we understand automatic negative thoughts, which are just those ones that kind of pop in and are often protective in nature, they're to try and lessen the blow, or we think that they're there to try and lessen the blow and protect us from things, we need to understand what the impact of those actually is. So on this slide, what I want you to have a look at is, this is from the basis of CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, what we, uh, primarily use often in psychology, but there's another form of this that I want to talk to you about as well. So when we're looking at this, you can see that we've got the event and the trigger. So that's what's happened. We then will have that automatic thought. Okay, From thought leads to an emotion. So often a really difficult emotion as a result of that. So sadness, 
anger. We come around to the physical. So we have that strong emotion. We move around to the physical and it might be that you start to feel chest pain, stomach upset, trembling, muscle tension, hyperventilating as well, or under breathing, holding your breath and then taking a deep breath as a result. And all of these things then lead up to a certain behavior. That can, behavior can be things like avoidance. So we get triggered by something. We have that automatic thought that it means, you know, people don't care about us. The emotion that follows on is a great degree of sadness. Physically, we feel slowed down. We feel heavy. The behavior then is that we withdraw from other people. We don't do the thing that we want to do. And all that ends up leading back to is the reinforcement of that thought. So if we respond to automatic negative thoughts as though they're true, we will end up reinforcing that too, which means the brain will keep on giving that back to us because it thinks that it's been useful. So I want to take you through a couple of examples about how this can actually work. Okay. First one, don't believe everything that you think. Not all thoughts are truth. We have thousands of thoughts during the course of the day. Not all of those are true. We can have some really bizarre thoughts often, and those ones are easier for us to label as being just kind of strange and wondering where that came from. It's the ones that tend to kind of matter to us that have emotional content that we think, oh, that's got to mean something, but it doesn't. The brain will give you lots of different thoughts and lots of different impulses. It depends on how we react to them and how much meaning we assign them as to how often those thoughts are going to keep coming back. So let me give you an example of how this can work. So let's say you're doing some cleaning and all of a sudden, oh, sharp pain, sharp pain in the ribs. Now that automatic thought that we were talking about before could be the cancer has come back or the cancer has spread. So that pain in my ribs, it's got to be cancer. The feeling or the emotion that comes from that is that increased anxiety, that heart racing, thoughts racing, fear, helplessness. For a lot of people, the behaviors that then come from that, so that next step on is panic, withdrawing from people close to us, reassurance seeking is another big one. That's when people will talk to others and try and get them to convince them that thought couldn't possibly be true. And the trouble with reassurance seeking is like saying to your partner, oh, I had that pain in my ribs, and I'm sure it's the cancer. And they say, no, it's not. Come on. You know what the last scan says. You know that that looked all clear. Don't worry about it. And if anyone has ever tried to get reassurance from someone else before and they've said that kind of stuff, you'll know full well that it actually does nothing. We go, yeah, okay, I hear you, but I'm still worried. It doesn't convince us. So reassurance seeking actually doesn't change very much of this at all. The result of the, all of that is that it is going to increase the likelihood that we're going to be hyper vigilant, so hyper aware of any like unknown pains in our body. We can end up avoiding things, so avoiding going to our next scan or moving the scan earlier to get that reassurance as well. And again, all that does is it feeds into that loop of hypervigilance, of thinking that a physical symptom must mean something bad. And as a result of that, we're either going to seek reassurance or we need evidence in front of us in order to feel better. And if that's what we do it off every time, those thoughts are just going to keep coming back. So the alternative to that then is if you have that automatic negative thought pop in, is naming it to start with. So that really does look like, huh, there's that cancer thought. Again, every time I have a pain, that's immediately what my brain thinks. Okay, let me make a note of it. I'm gonna pop a note in my phone with the date and where I felt this pain, and I'm just going to keep an eye on it. Now that's very different than going, oh, I've got a pain in my ribs, it must be the cancer. We don't wanna ignore physical signs, but we also don't want to automatically label them as being something bad. That one is just neutral curiosity about what that could possibly be. But we're also recording it to make sure if there is consistency in this pain reoccurring, that we get it checked out. The feeling that then comes from that is looking at doing some breathing exercises or some grounding work or finding something that distracts you in a, a, a feel good way, thing, re-engaging in things that you enjoy. Explaining to someone close to you what the fear is 
but not asking for reassurance from them. So this is a key difference. You can still talk to your partner or your friends or whoever your close people are and say, so every time I keep getting these little sharp niggly pains, I automatically think it's the cancer. And you might want to tell me that I'm being silly, but you don't need to tell me anything. What I've been doing is I've just been writing it down. And if it keeps coming back or if I keep noticing this over the next couple of weeks, I'll give my breast care nurse a call or I'll go and see the GP and I'll get it checked out at that point. But, oh, these thoughts just bother me. And so you're still getting support at that point. But what you're not doing is reinforcing the thought by getting them to try and dispel it for you. Because like we talked about before, that doesn't work anyway. And what that tends to do over time is it reduces the reaction to those thoughts. So if you've written that down in a note and then nothing has happened for the next two weeks, you are much less likely to then tune into every single little niggle. You might pop a note in to keep aware of it so you're not missing things, but there's not that tendency to overreact to every single one. I'll take you through one more example on how this works. An upcoming scan, and that's a big one for for a lot of people. So the automatic thought that can come is treatment hasn't worked. The cancer will have come back or spread. The feeling that then follows is anxiety, tensions or muscles, that hypervigilance, behaviors are often uh, being unable to sleep, being snappy, withdrawing, reassurance seeking, lots of the same stuff from that previous slide. And the result is usually feeling overwhelmed and like we're not coping and then the end result is further anxiety around every single scan because the anxiety will come back down potentially following the results of getting the scan. If they're, they're either showing stable disease or they're showing disease reduction you can go, oh good, I feel better. But then you're only feeling better on the basis of what those scan results are showing. Yep. So again, it just ends up reinforcing that the only way that I feel better is if I've got evidence for this. So, the alternative to that again is naming it. And again, I encourage you guys, there's a big lot of stigma around talking out loud to yourselves. If you are by yourself, say this stuff out loud. There is nothing like being able to hear a thought for what it is to take a lot of the heat out of it, but to also clearly show you sometimes just how kind of far out those thoughts can be. So saying to yourself, this is part of my scheduled treatment. Like, of course you're anxious. Of course I am. This worries me, but there's nothing I can do between now and the scan. So the feeling there needs to be, or the emotion attached, let's do something with this. So in the lead up to the scan, I need to be seeking support, not reassurance, but support. I need to be doing things that are in my kind of self-care plan for all of this as well, and allow myself to acknowledge, of course I'm worried. A very good technique that we tend to use is something called postponing worry. So if you know that you have a scan on a certain date and then the follow up for the results booked for a certain date, every time that thought comes up, you say to yourself, hmm, that's booked for the 19th. The 19th isn't here yet. I give myself permission to worry about this on the 19th. Until then, what else could I be doing with today? And actually doing that and giving the worry a time to be placed on has a really good effect of reducing that. But the trick is you need to, every time that thought comes up, you give it that date again. Nope, that date's not here yet. I will worry about it. I will deal with it when it comes to that. Until then, I just need to make sure that I'm getting support and keeping as well mentally as I possibly can. So the behavior then follows on is we're acknowledging the thought, we're postponing the worry. Over time, what that ends up doing is it's not going to remove all of your anxiety around upcoming scans, but it will reduce the length of time in the lead up to those. They are anxiety provoking times, absolutely. But spending two weeks before your anxiety, uh, your scan rather, spending two weeks before your scan, being worried about it every single day and fixating on it every single day robs you of that time. Allowing yourself to get support and then on the day, yeah, like feeling those feelings of anxiety and knowing that they're going to sit there, that keeps it to where it needs to be instead of losing all of that time in the lead up to anxiety that's not doing anything to change the results one way or the other. 
So we've talked a lot about thoughts, but the next big thing to talk about is feelings and emotions. For a lot of people, we don't make a lot of space for what we would call negative emotions. Okay, You can't selectively numb emotions. Usually I would do this kind of this next little task with an audience and I would say, hey guys, give me some names of different feelings that you can think. If I had to do that at the moment, um, I would say something like happy, sad, whoop, one finger Chloe, happy, sad, angry, fearful, joyful, angry. You're all I've got off the top of my head. Now, if we look at that split, which way is my camera? That way. So on this hand, I've got two of what we would technically call positive emotions or good emotions. This side, I've got four that we would technically label as negative. But if you actually look at those in general, they are just emotions. That's all they are. Um, trying to put things into the good or bad basket really ends up getting stuck. Because there are no negative emotions. We get taught from the time that we're very small that some are good and acceptable. And when we're happy, we're much more acceptable people. And when we're sad or when we're angry, that's unacceptable stuff. There's something wrong with it. And so we get it built into us as though we're doing something wrong by feeling all of this. But it's just not the case. The more that we try and tell ourselves that you're not allowed to feel this kind of stuff, the more it will pop up. And this side of treatment um, is more what we call ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy, which is not as woo woo as it sounds. Essentially what this form of therapy does, which is very different to CBT, is what we look at here is actually just normalizing emotional experiences, trying to teach people that the more they try and suppress the stuff that they think isn't okay, the more it will come up. And this form of therapy actually teaches people to manage and to notice those emotions without trying to fight against them all the time. Most of the time, the thing that gets us caught up in knots more than anything is feeling a certain way and pulling against it. Okay. And a good uh, metaphor for this is quicksand. Now, if you think about the quicksand as being whatever difficult situation or difficult emotion that you might find yourself in. Now, the one thing you're not meant to do when you're in quicksand is struggle. The one thing you're meant to do in quicksand is to stay still. Now, if we struggle, we sink deeper. We sink deeper really fast, but it's the natural thing to do when we find ourselves in a situation or an emotion that we don't want and we don't like. We're going to struggle our way out of it. I don't like it. I don't want it. I want it gone. Then you're up to here with the quicksand. Staying still and dropping the struggle doesn't change the fact that you're in quicksand. It does not change that situation. What it does do, though, is it stops you sinking deeper. It gives you a chance to look at your environment, to find the supports that you need, find a way of managing that without sinking deeper in it. And that's a very quick, you know, five second snapshot on the kind of therapy that ACT is. But what I find is it's a very realistic form of therapy too, because CBT will teach us how to deal with the automatic negative thoughts and to try and dispute them and to tell that thought that that's not true. The trouble is, though, that little voice that we all know that we've got in our heads often will kick in and go, yeah, but it doesn't feel like that or it doesn't feel like that's not true. So you can do really nice disputing of thoughts. And if that little voice kicks in, those emotions trump logic for the most part. So ACT can be incredibly helpful in this kind of area because it teaches people how to manage all of these emotions without trying to label them as true or false or getting all tied up in them. So the next important thing that I want to talk about is how we talk about cancer, how we talk to people who are living with cancer, who are going through treatment, because I would be very surprised if all of you have not come across some very interesting statements 
from people around you, potentially well-meaning. Um, people often want to come from a place of being well-meaning, but can accidentally say some really unhelpful or really clunky things that can lead you to end up feeling kind of worse, worse overall, or just not heard or not understood or labeled in a way that's not helpful. So let's talk about why language matters so much. So the typical things that people tend to talk about is fighting cancer, is battling, is winning the fight against it. Hearing things like, you're so strong, you're tougher than this, you can beat it, I know you can, you can't let it win. It puts so much pressure and the onus of how treatment comes back it comes out rather back onto the person who is dealing with it. How many times have you turned on the TV or heard on the radio that someone has lost their battle to cancer? Now that somehow implies that they entered into this knowing that they were going to fight it. There's no personal responsibility for losing against cancer. It doesn't fight fair. No one asked to be in this. And so we need to be really careful about the way that we're talking about this kind of stuff because it matters and it puts pressure back on people. And again, a lot of people don't say this kind of stuff knowing that it's the wrong thing to say. It's because that's what we hear in the media. It's what we hear everywhere is this idea of focusing on the positive all the time and somehow thinking that that's going to make the other person feel better. But it has really serious effects. Now I say this not wanting to take away labels that people have for themselves that actually do feel important. So if you refer to yourself and comfortably refer to yourself as having won the battle with cancer and that feels comfortable to you, then that is okay. That's not up to me to say that that's not an okay statement. It's just to say for a lot of people that onus on them having some responsibility in how all of this comes out doesn't often feel helpful. But if you have one of these that I've just mentioned and that feels good, then that's okay. Please don't take it as me saying that you've adopted a not okay title in all of this. The only thing that matters is how comfortable you are in it. So I want to talk about what I was just saying in terms of that idea in society uh, that keeping positive is somehow going to make things better. So some of you might have heard of this idea of toxic positivity. It's kind of, it's becoming a little bit more well known. Not everyone has heard of it. But basically examples of this are like, you just have to be positive. Think on the bright side. Things could be worse. Never give up. Um, you have to stop being so negative. All that ends up making people feel is there's no space for them to be honest about how difficult this is at times. It can just make them feel not heard, not validated in any of it. And I can promise you, if you give toxic positivity to other people, they're very unlikely to come back and seek support again. Alternatives to some of that, like the just stay positive, is just to kind of say, that must be really hard or everything happens for a reason. I'm sorry you're going through this. Things will work out or look in the bright side. This sounds really hard at the moment. Is there anything I can do to support you? We don't always have to try and fix hard things. Sometimes hard things are just hard. They don't have an easy fix and putting a platitude on it doesn't change any of that. And that is why I was so set at the beginning on saying there'll be no inspirational quotes here because a lot of those can just be examples of that toxic positivity. Reading one of those quotes does not make it feel all better for people. You are going through something hard and that needs to be acknowledged. So if you come up against this kind of stuff and you feel comfortable telling the person who has said it how that makes you feel, then I encourage you to do it because people can't do better if they don't know better. That being said, I'm a realist. So there's going to be lots of people that you're not that close to them or you don't feel comfortable saying that kind of stuff. And that's okay too. It's not your responsibility to carry the torch for all of this. 
But what I would encourage you to do is when you see and hear it and you feel comfortable and able, share some of this insight with people because it is powerful. The next thing we're going to talk about is some of the groups that you actually might hear some of this stuff the most, which is the people who are around you and those who, um, who form your support networks. Family is a big one. And when I say family, I mean whatever family looks like for you. Okay, that doesn't necessarily look like, um, you know, a husband and two kids and a picket fence. Everyone's family looks different. And so please just know that when I'm referring to family, I'm referring to whatever family looks like for you. So during cancer treatment, what we know is that you and your family's needs need to be recognized. Family needs and concerns are usually one of the, the highest levels of distress reported for people going through cancer for patients and that they are concerned about how everyone else is doing. Um, that changes over time too. So the kind of distress that family members will have in the really early stages, whether at the point of diagnosis or going through treatment, that often changes. It can sometimes drop as yours increases. So taking into consideration the impact on family and making sure that they are supported as well in this and that they know what to say and aren't just trying to give you reassurance all the time or giving you that toxic positivity that you're not really needing. They need to know how to manage all of this and their own distress during it too. Impacts on partners and relationships, again, however that looks like, however that looks rather for you, is really important. So partners and loved ones often report stress kind of at level or even higher than patients themselves, but they usually receive less support. Um, and I know that that is a limitation, for example, um, in our service in Darwin is that we offer to see um, all patients, their loved ones and their family members um, from the point of diagnosis onwards. However, if we've got an increase in service demand, so if we've got a lot of referrals coming through and we are very booked, the first thing that usually needs to drop off is the family and the loved one referrals because we need to prioritize patients at that point. And so there is a gap in all of that, that there isn't necessarily consistency that we're able to meet those needs. And that's with us being you know, a fully staffed psychology service at Alan Walker. So if you don't have access to psychology services where you're receiving treatment, I can only imagine that that would be even more challenging for family to access appropriate services. Um, there are other challenges that come on partners and relationships as well. There's um, changes in terms of what information needs they have as well, changes in terms of sexual changes, relational dynamics, expectations, how it's safe to show affection and intimacy and what all of that looks like and who suddenly changed roles and is taking on more or less in the home. It is a really challenging time. Children are massively affected by this too, obviously. And again, I say children, I mean children of any age, despite me having a picture there of a playground, because we know that it's not just young children that are impacted by this, no matter what the age of your children, adult children are impacted as well. You're still their parent at the end of the day. Um, they do have high levels of stress as well and an, in need of support. That's gonna vary though, depending on their ages, um, the kind of diagnosis that you have and the kind of treatment that you're undergoing as well. They often end up having uh, less time spent socially. They feel a bit different than their peers. They often lack the language about how to deal with all of this. Um, and if they are young children, I can't stress the importance enough about making sure that if they're in school, for example, that the school is aware that they are checking in on them, if they have counselling services attached to the school, ensuring that the counsellor is keeping an eye on things or that they have access to, to seek a referral if you're noticing changes with them. If they're particularly young children, then play therapy can be of assistance as well. I think some of the worst things that can happen is that hiding information from children, regardless of their age, on that basis of we don't want to worry them. Um, you would know yourself from the time that you were younger that just because the adult doesn't tell you exactly what's going on doesn't mean you don't know that something big is happening. And children, if they're not told, tend to just invent their own reality 
and often they make it worse. They'll go to the worst case scenario. So finding some resources, Canteen is fabulous, Camp Quality as well, have some wonderful resources about how to talk to children and young people about cancer in an appropriate way are really great. And all I can say is keeping information and thinking, well, it won't worry them, then I will just deal with it myself. They will be worried. You think about if that role was reversed and you were thinking about your own parent, you would be concerned and they would be too. So having open conversations and allowing that dialogue to happen is very important. Impacts on friendships. Now this is quite a big one. And th this slide is actually bigger than the last two in terms of the impacts on family, on partners and relationships and on children. Because for a lot of us, friendships form a really key part of our emotional support structure. So some friends may struggle with feelings of helplessness and they might distance themselves. They might feel that this is so big and so overwhelming that they don't know how to deal with it, that it brings up their own fears um, of this kind of diagnosis around mortality and that they can't deal with it and they withdraw. And that's not a reflection on how much they care about you. It's a reflection on where their capacity is for this stuff. Um, the other thing is I can say is pick your people. <laughs> pick your people and tell them what you need. Please don't expect mind reading like we talked about on that um, the automatic thought slide is if you've got certain people in your world that you know are good at certain things, so you know Jane, she is going to be fantastic at bringing meals, but she's probably not the kind of person that is going to ab be able to handle me if I'm feeling particularly fragile emotionally. So give them the tasks that you know that they can come to the table with, okay? Um, you know, another friend, Lee, she would be fabulous for sitting with you and holding space for those difficult emotions. Is she likely to remember to pick you up for that ride to chemo? No. So don't give people tasks that you know that they're not up to because all that ends up doing is leading to disappointment and then you feel unsupported. Um, a lot of people will do some of that toxic positivity that we talked about so they'll, they won't know what to say and they'll revert to what they think they should say in this space. And again, if they are close enough, I encourage you to gently let them know what is helpful and what's unhelpful in this space. They may try and avoid the subject altogether. They may not want to talk about it. They may not know how to. And again, don't take their avoidance as necessarily being an indication of them not caring, but them just not knowing how to come to the table with it. Some will offer some really helpful treatment suggestions. So, you know, my friend so-and-so drank three kilos of organic carrots every day um, and that made her cancer go away. Or have you heard about this other treatment? I heard that if you go sugar-free, it will do X, Y, Z. People mean well when they try and bring this stuff. Again, it's about looking for solutions. The more quickly you can gently kind of shut those suggestions down and even just say, I really trust my oncologist and my treating team. We've got a great plan and it kind of, you know, it gives me too much extra things to think about when I start to entertain all of this other stuff. So no, you're trying to be helpful, but I feel okay with what my pathway is at the moment it can be really important because it just, it adds extra noise and extra concerns about whether your treatment is going to be effective or not. If people are trying to, you know, input a whole lot of, why don't you try this and why don't you try that? the end of the day with friends, there's no definitive handbook on how to handle this. They're going to be as confused as you feel at times. So giving them the benefit of the doubt at times and knowing that they're not always going to be able to meet your needs in the way that you have them because at the end of the day, they don't understand. They might try, but they're not living it. So making adjustments for some of that and the closer that they are, sharing with them what those needs are. Now the impacts on me, the most important thing. So who am I now? Life doesn't feel normal, will I ever feel normal? Again, what the heck is normal after all of this? I don't wanna go back to the same job, the same role. I feel like my values and beliefs have shifted. Um, there can be thoughts and fears of mortality as well. That's regardless of whether you have a terminal diagnosis or people are saying that it's curative. Any cancer diagnosis will bring up thoughts and fears around death. 
But particularly in Western cultures, we're not really encouraged to have those conversations. Every time anyone tries to ever bring up thoughts or worries about death and dying, they usually shut down pretty quickly. They, oh, you know, that's not going to happen. You're going to be okay. That'll be fine. That's not going to happen for a long time. And we even do it to ourselves. We push those thoughts and those fears of mortality right out. We go, when I'm 90 and I've had a nice dinner and a glass of wine, I just want to go to bed and not wake up. That would be fabulous. Except that's not the way it happens for most of us. And that fear that we have around having these conversations just leads us to feeling all the less prepared in general. If you do seek support and go to see a psychologist or a counsellor in this space, I would really encourage you to have some of those bigger discussions around things. Talking about it doesn't mean that it's going to happen, but having that space where you're not fearing worrying other people or that you think I want to talk to my partner about this and I know that they can't handle that space come and talk to someone else first and we can help with giving you the language and to sit comfortably with that and to not shy away from having those big discussions but all of these kind of things the who am I life doesn't feel normal these are big things and you need and you deserve support in dealing with them and deciding what you want life to look like and how you want to identify and what's important for you. And that's not a process that can happen like that. That takes time. I want to talk on this slide a little bit about some practical things. So social media use to start with. Now, everyone, for the most part, is on social media these days, and it can be really helpful. But it is really important to be aware of where you're getting your information and if it is evidence based or not. There are lots of support groups online, particularly on Facebook, but you will also see things all over Twitter and Insta. And they might seem like they're supportive groups to be in, that you're going to get lots of information. Not always. People are overseas and they are going uh, through different treatment protocols because that's what's approved in their country it can lead us to question as to whether or not we're getting the right treatment often the people on those groups are often the ones whose treatments are not necessarily going well so you're going to get very skewed information then you're going to be fed a lot of information but not all of it factual so the people who have had really good treatment results um, and are out there living life they're not sitting on forums posting constantly. The ones who are having a more difficult time are there. So all of the kind of information that you're going to be getting is going to have a negative skew to it and then that can colour our thinking about how things are going too. You can also come across a lot of uh, toxic positivity on social media as well. So just approach with caution. Being aware of what we call like a cognitive bias as well is very, very important. Example of that can be after you receive a cancer diagnosis, it can suddenly feel like the, the term cancer or cancer itself is everywhere. You're just hearing it on the radio, you're seeing it on buses, it's popping up in the news, it's everywhere. And it's actually not. It hasn't changed. That's what we call a confirmation bias. Okay. So when the brain decides that something is really important and relevant for us, what it will do is it turns the radar system right up and it casts a very wide net to get all kinds of information about the same thing. So the amount that cancer is around is exactly the same as before. You're just going to be picking up on it a lot more than you will have previously. Same kind of phenomenon as if you or a friend buy a brand new car, all of a sudden you see those cars everywhere like why all of a sudden is there dark blue rav4s absolutely everywhere there's not they've always been there it's just suddenly because that is important and relevant to you your brain suddenly picks up on it everywhere uh, the seeking good information comes back to that first one always approach with caution with things make sure that you're getting things from reputable sources doing realistic self-care things are not all bubble baths and candles using what you know works for you Self-care does not need to be big and glorious and grand. Sometimes self-care just needs to actually look like putting your phone down, moving away from it, giving yourself time and space. If you've got people checking in on you constantly and constantly wanting information, making a decision about appointing one person who knows how much and what they're able to share and who they're able to share that with, 
and getting them to be the one who disseminates information so you're not having to do that constantly. Boundaries. Just because you have a cancer diagnosis does not mean that your information is a free for all. So gently reminding people or even saying to them, I just don't want to talk about that if they're asking really personal questions. The number of times that I've had conversations with people where they have come back and they've said, I was in the line at Woolies. And they came up and they started asking me about everything, about how my scar's healing. And they don't want to have those talks. <laughs> Some people don't have great filtering systems about answering or asking questions rather. So understanding how you yourself want to respond in that kind of space if someone invades your privacy can be a really val valuable thing to do. How you need support. This is not a one size fits all and this comes back a little bit to what we were talking about on the friendship slide. Working out for you what you need practically, emotionally, socially. Not everyone needs the same stuff. Not everyone needs the meals cooked. Some people are fine with that, but they need a ride to chemo or they need the kids picked up from school or they need someone to do the Woolies run for them. That that is just too much. Work out what that looks like for you. Same with the emotional support. Not everyone needs someone that they can go and talk to in depth about it with friends, but work out if that is what you need. If your feelings and your needs are being met at the time. The last couple of things that I want to leave you with is just giving yourself permission in this space to not have to be brave all the time. I just want to remind you, there's no right or wrong way to do all of this. Okay. Identifying what brings meaning and value for you in life. And again, that looks unique for everyone, but focusing on that little stuff, what makes me feel good? How are the small ways that I spend my day that I end up feeling better? at the end of it is that having a meal with my partner and slowing down is it making sure the kids have their story is it making sure that i gave my adult kids a call is it making sure that i got myself down um, to that cup of coffee with a friend that i said that i would catch up with and not canceling that i did um, work out what that means for you finding areas that you can realistically control a big part of what is so distressing about a cancer diagnosis is that feeling of loss of control. But it's really that we always just had this perception of having control in our lives. Our lives have actually never been that in control, really. It's just a cancer diagnosis takes the few things that we are able to control, like work and how we structure our life. That stuff kind of goes for a bit. But in terms of how the whole world operates, we have very little control over how all of that stuff works. So again, bring it back to the small everyday stuff that you can control because that can bring a much better sense of just settling. And finally, the last things that I just want to say is to acknowledge that you have been given a really unfair and frightening diagnosis. Allowing yourself to feel all of the emotional kind of struggles and distress that come with that does not mean that you're weak or that there's something wrong with you. Asking for support does not mean you're not strong enough or that you're not doing this right. These kind of services and us as a profession, we're here for a reason. We know that this is unique and this is difficult and you are worthy and deserving of having support. If you are dealing with a metastatic diagnosis, then what I would hope is that that automatically triggers a referral for you with your consent to see someone, whether that's a counselor or a social worker or a psychologist, but having a diagnosis like that is big. And so I would really encourage you if you haven't been offered that to please ask for it. At the end of the day though, no matter what stage you are at, we would really encourage you if you are at all distressed or struggling or just feeling uncertain or just needing a little bit of guidance with this to please seek out a referral. For us as professionals who work in this kind of area, we for the most part all acknowledge just how much of a privilege it is to work with you all and to hear your stories and to help be supportive in whatever way we can. I've been in this specialty for seven years now and have headed up these services and it has never stopped feeling 
like a very special responsibility to to hear people's stories and to be able to work with you. So I hope that you are able to find someone to connect with who can give you that sense of guidance and support and some strategies with dealing with the challenges that you have ahead of you. Thank you for letting me speak to all of you today and thank you for bearing with the fact that I'm just a talking head on a screen today. If there are any questions, any follow-up things needed, please contact BCNA um, and I'm very happy to send out some resources. Thank you all so much.